Uh, this is Ramsey Salty coming to you here on the Herbology Online Show and with uh, a very, very anticipated spirit of excitement, I am welcoming to this amazing talk, the one and only Hamid Sinno. Hamid, ahla wa sahla. Hi, kifak. Tamam, kifak inta. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Where are you, Hamid? I'm in Philadelphia. Um, from New York to Philadelphia, I hear. Yeah, of I course. came here a few months ago. Um, COVID made New York kind of effusive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I hear you're, you're taking courses in Philadelphia. Yeah, I mean, everything is on Zoom. I started a grad program at Dartmouth in September. Um, it's like full time, so the hustle is insane. Mashallah. Mashallah. And I have to say, you moved from New York to a swing state and with the, uh, with the, with the elections uh, coming up, but we need you more, I think, in Philadelphia. Here are basically, you just need to be able to show that you've been in the state, that you've been, sorry, at the same address for 30 days prior to the election date, which is, I mean, amazing. Um, yeah. So I get, to, I get to vote in Philly. Oh, good. I don't need to remind you. Uh, so, uh, Hamid, uh, I mean, how long did you end up staying in New York? I know you left Lebanon a while back uh, to New York. Um, how, how was, you know, it's hard to ask you this question, but how do you sum up Hamid's years in New York before Philadelphia? You know, I was in New York for a year and a bit, a year and a half, almost. I, I moved last April and I didn't move to Philadelphia until early August. Um, New York was kind of very much what I needed, I think. Um, you know, I mean, you know how things, um, how things were starting to play out in Lebanon and in the Middle East. There was just a lot of tension and I felt like I couldn't escape the, um, the politics, but also my sort of like life in public started to feel very claustrophobic. Um, so getting away to New York was just really, um, generative, I think. And um, I mean, I don't know how to ask this. This is the hardest question I have to ask. But you were in New York when we, you heard about the explosions in, uh, in Lebanon? Yeah. Yeah, I was here in California. As you know, I was born and raised in Lebanon myself, but a different Lebanon than yours. I think this was way before you were born, Hamid. Um, I mean, I, I, I hate to ask you this question, but I think it's important. I mean, how, how did you receive the news and how did you deal with this surreal reality we suddenly woke up to? You know, it's, it's, um, it's very strange that I don't know, I guess I haven't spent enough time in the States to, to feel fully detached from Beirut just yet. I don't know if that you know, sort of ever happens. Um, but, you know, a year and a half is not a very long time, I guess. Um, and I haven't been spending a lot of time on social media because it's brought me nothing but <laughs> like a lot of anger over the years. Um, but, you know, sort of serendipitously, I guess I was, I was on Facebook when people started posting and the, the explosion was so loud that everyone thought the explosion was in their neighborhood, right? So I was getting these conflicting statuses on Facebook from people saying it was in an invasive, people saying it was in downtown, people saying it was in Shiyeh, um, you know, just very, very, very far areas. And I read a couple of things that said it was in the neighborhood that my parents' house is in. Um, so of course, immediately, you know, my mother lives sort of across the street from Rafiq Hariri's like palace. Um, so it is sort of a strategic location in that sense. So I got really worried and, and it took my mom about 15 minutes to see my messages and get back to me. So those 15 minutes were, I mean, I'm sure you know this, it's, it's, we've all inherited that sort of Lebanese trauma. Oh, the the longest 15 happens. minutes. Yeah. 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 And, and was she okay, Hamid? Uh, my mother was her. fine. Nothing happened to her, alhamdulillah. She, uh, she got out a few days later. But it was just such an interesting, interesting, I mean, I hate saying this. I hate saying it was an interesting moment. It was a tragic moment. Right? But something happened that in hindsight is just particular, I guess, which is that, you know, time, time, temporality completely changed. 
um, it was almost like every past moment of these explosions or these sort of political uncertainties collapsed into this one present moment, right? And I was the same person that I was the first time I ever heard an explosion, same person that I was in 2006 during the war with Israel, same person that I was in 2008, same person I was every time there was a car bomb in Beirut. It's just the same motions so if you go on autopilot and you start texting everyone that you know to try and make sure that they're okay. And for a minute, you kind of forget when you are. I don't know if that makes sense. It's just, it does. It's its yeah. own. It's it's its own temporal space. It's very strange. Not only uh, not only you forget where you are. I think it's when you are. I love yeah. that uh, habit. Um, so maybe one of the. You know, the ways that you coped and the way we're all trying to cope in terms of uh, art and what we can do has been some of these amazing Habibi uh, projects you were involved in to help raise awareness and to help raise funds, I think, for Beirut. And one of them has been this concert with Mika, which has received a lot of publicity and I hear has uh, garnered, what, about a million euros that went towards helping the Lebanese Red Cross and save the children. And there was, of course, this amazing collaboration that happened online between Mika and Mashrua Layla. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience uh, in the age of Zoom and how you all of that came together? Yeah, I mean, these things are, I mean, I guess they, it doesn't really make this whole like, COVID life to start with didn't make sense, but then it kind of establishes its own routines, right? Where things quickly normalize. So the band working long distance was difficult and always has been difficult, but then working long distance during COVID kind of just made sense in its own way. Um, you know, I never once sort of like spoke to Mika directly. His people contacted the band and we agreed to do this collaboration. It was amazing that he decided to do this. You know, this was very much Mika's, Mika's labor, um, if I'm being honest. Um, it was really just beautiful to see how many people he managed to, to round up to do this. Um, and so like Haig and I were in New York, but we're not working together. We're working from our homes, right? And the band was in Beirut and they're working from their separate homes. So we're working from these like four different spaces and then Mika's working from another space. And then just trying to put everything together was really, really like, it was just, it's strange. It's a, it's a whole new world, I guess. It was, but in some ways it was so uplifting to see how borders didn't matter when that moment came together. Um, to see you and I um, sort of, what was it, like almost a holograph uh, image, uh, knowing that the rest of the band wasn't even in the same country. Uh, it all came together and the song, was it called, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Hamid, was it called Promised Land by Mika? Yeah. And then you went and introduced some Arabic lyrics into the <laughs> song. <laughs> Was that yeah, your doing, young it. man? Hey, hey. Yeah, I, I, I translated it. <laughs> So um, when you, I mean, did you get a chance to see the, the performance after you, it was I done did. from the eyes of us, of the uh, viewers? Uh, yeah, I didn't get to see it until, until, every, until the world did. Right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it was it was a moment, Habibi. As was your. Um, this is gonna. This I, I'm. I'm gonna try not to tear up, but I do want to talk about this one song that I heard uh, a few weeks ago, and that has not left me. It has just sort of. It's so poignant uh, in its uh, simplicity. I think you know. You know what I'm talking about. If not, I'm going. To to share with you. Yahriqunana Kayyudiyu Qusurahum Yujawiyunana Yujawiyunana 
يحرقوننا كي يضيئوا قصورهم in classical Arabic it just hit home for me um, what can you tell me about this this track which by the way is available uh, on uh, you know different uh, media platforms uh, I download I think I was the first to download it Hamid. but yeah. anyway uh, can you tell me about these lyrics about you know and also the fact that the video at least on your Instagram is showing sort of a, a figure <laughs> I'm gonna let you explain yeah um, look I feel like I'm someone who unfortunately doesn't really know how to process life unless I'm trying to put it into like words and and or melodies, right? And it's terrible in its own way, right? Because my, my relationship to music over the years has become very much about not being in music. It's almost about like using music as a means to process, which is not very healthy. But um, when the bomb happened, it was, it was so intense that I started writing and the song just came out and it is very simple and very immediate. And um, yeah, I get, there's something that feels weird sometimes about trying to, to put music out in the middle of these really intense moments. It almost feels like it's opportunistic, but it, it was what it was. I, I could not process otherwise, and I just put it on Instagram originally. Um, and there was this interview that happened the day, a day or two before I released it, where the president was... Um, was doing this exclusive interview with a French news station. And he was doing this thing that was so disturbing where he's sitting on this armchair and throughout the interview, he's just gripping the armrests so intensely and just clutching onto the, onto the chair. And it just felt like such a obvious, it felt like his own metaphor for this person who just will not sort of abdicate the throne, right? It's just like, will not leave. <laughs> Um, so the video was just close-ups on his hands for the course of three and a half minutes or however long it's all was. يَحْرِقُونَنَا كَيْ يُضِيءُوا خُسُورَهُمْ They burn us, they use us as if we were the light to light up their palaces. I know uh, how this is hitting uh, Arabic speakers. Who's the, I mean, I hate to ask this, but can you explain who they are? The Lebanese oligarchy. Um, it's yeah. not one. It's not one party in specific, right? It's yeah. the entire, this entire occupying government that has been occupying the country for decades at this point. I do love the Nahnu Yahrikunana as a whole. Uh, one of the most. I know you don't necessarily want to hear this, but one of the most healing, empowering songs I've heard, very sad. But that song really, really told me or em emphasized how important music can be in a time like this. You mentioned you feel it might be almost opportunistic to be releasing music, but I, at least on my behalf, that music has been healing, if not necessary, Hamid, and I, and I thank you on behalf thank of so you. many people for putting that out. Um, you know. You know, that uh, collaboration with Mika, with the Arabic, and I'm going to move to something more joyous, leads me to one of the songs which, when I had my Arabology show at Stanford Radio, um, when I would play this song, listeners would go crazy. And this is going to make you smile, I hope. It's your collaboration with Hercules and Love Affair. 
Right. It was a song called "Are You Certain?" Ilibadek with that kid, and I don't know what it is about that song, but if I ever wanted to get people to tune in, I'd play that, and you would get Americans and Arab Americans and people from all the world calling the station, going, "What the heck is he saying in Arabic? And how did this happen?" So I would be a miss, Habib, if I didn't ask you about how that collaboration came about. You uh, anything you could tell us? Oh God, I'm trying to think. First of all, thank you. Um, and yeah, I agree. There's something really catchy about it. Andy, the, the guy from Hercules and Love Affair, did such an incredible job. Um, he's did really, he approach like, a phenomenal you? Or, or, I mean, how, how did it uh, happen? Do you remember? I'm trying to remember how it happened. I don't know if it was one of those things where I was following him on Instagram or it was the other way around. We just ended up having like a conversation and passing online. Um, and it turned into like a conversation about collaborating. And, um, you know, Andy, Andy really <laughs> saved my life in a lot of ways that, you know, maybe we can elaborate on later. But um, I kind of, I just went to, to Ghent, uh, where he was living at the time. And we kind of just hammered it out over the wow. course of like one weekend. How so, it happened so organically. I mean, that just, that chorus stays with you, and it's such a danceable, joyous song. And and I just love Thank the you. Arabic lyrics and how they go with the uh, with the beat. <laughs> Another collaboration, Habibna, that I think is just so amazing has been with Narsi. I mean, you've done a couple of things with Narsi in terms of uh, superhero, I think that was featuring you. But I'd like to maybe have you, if you don't mind, tell me about that gorgeous video and that gorgeous collaboration with Narsi, the, the, the song Zaman, and that breathtaking video clip that was released. Uh, can you, what can you tell me about that experience, Hamid? Um, so much. Honestly, Narsi is, is a rare, a rare gem. He's one of, it's not very common, honestly, to, to, for me at least, it hasn't been very common to, to meet musicians that just immediately become family. Narsi is someone who is so kind and kind-hearted and generous and gives everything to his work and to his friends. And you know, he's, he's always been there for everyone in the band. This guy is incredible. We toured together several times. He's magic. Um, he's just such a kind, kind, smart, you know, hardworking person. And the video was his, you know, again, his labor, his sort of ideas. He, he's just this incredible, incredible brain. Um, so that song it also happened pretty organically. We, he sent some stuff, some like ideas that were like pretty developed, but then wanted us to work on like a, a hook for it. So then we changed the hook and then we ended up changing the, like it just went back and forth with like everyone changing something from like the previous draft over a course of time. And then eventually we ended up with this thing that he liked and he, he finalized the production on it. And, and, and it was, yeah. where was, where was it filmed, Hamid? Where was this gorgeous... In Beirut, in, in Lebanon, not Beirut, sorry. Uh, yeah, where, where is that? Part, Different... of it is, uh, part of it is the Rashid Karame Fair in Tripoli, which was built by Oscar Niemeyer in the 60s. It was a, an abandoned project that was never sort of fully completed, but it's just this, this breathtaking piece of like Brazilian modernist architecture. Um, parts of it were... I have no idea where his entire shot list was. <laughs> I know, I know, we were we were there. <laughs> he shot in other places in Lebanon as well. <laughs> Father screaming, and he was either bored or even sure to leave it. Striving. 
trying to make a living decent. I was struggling with my demons, lying to my mother, even stealing out a purse was my weakness. If I could find a reason, I tried to keep up with my friends around me with more money than we did. Hamid, I'm about to do something I would not do in a normal interview, but I do want to share this one picture with you. <laughs> Oh, God. And I'm going to take you back. Well, if you say, oh, God, look at me, what happened to this old man? Oh, you look amazing. Oh, please, thank you. I don't know what I'm saying. But uh, <laughs> in, truth, uh, in truth, that picture was taken the first time we met Hamid back in uh, Beirut. It was almost 10 years ago. I was there visiting, and I was just starting my Arabology show. And you were kind enough to come and meet me. And I think you came with a few friends and we sat here at the uh, next to the Mediterranean. This was 2011. And uh, you gave me this beautiful interview that has always meant a lot to me uh, and that I aired when I got back to America. Uh, we're 10 years later. One of the questions I asked you in that interview when you were sitting there, Hamid, was, well, where do you picture yourself in 10 years, young man? You know, that kind of question. And I don't know if I'm you so remember. I'm so scared to just, hear what I uh, said. Uh, well, I'm going to say it frightened. because, I mean, it, it's out there, but it's... it's uh, no, you said, I really hope that I will be, you know, a singer, that I will be a, continue to be a songwriter. I want to impact change. I want to continue doing this. And uh, and here you are 10 years later. I mean, Mashroor Layla, how do you explain Mashroor Layla? 10 years of... Uh, of controversy, of success, of empowerment, of courage, of persistence, uh, despite the odds. Um, so I guess I should be cheesy and ask, are you where you thought you'd be when we talked 10 years ago? You're like really coming for me. I don't know why I have, so I, have emotional I, have, I have Kleenex with me uh, prepared for this. But I think this is part of, you know, the cathartic feeling you have when you um, uh, join again, your, your path crosses again with somebody who has really, I'm so proud of you guys. And I have always sang your praises as a band, as individuals in, uh, at Stanford. I've been Thank there uh, so uh, 22 years. You know, it's been crazy. How would you if, if, if I'm being honest, it has been crazy. Um, you know, the, the, the dream sort of kind of happened, right? And then it turned out to be much more complicated than, than I guess any of us thought it would be. Um, it's been, it's been, really, if, if I'm being honest, it's been brutal. Um, I'm very grateful, you know, that I, that I get to sing, um, that I got to sing for the last like 12 years, I guess. But um, just constantly, constantly having to, to, to deal with this never ending flurry of, of hate has just been way too much um, and there's there's really no there's no way to process that amount of negativity and, and come out okay right um, so it has honestly taken taken its toll on, on everyone in the band and taken its toll on me and it's, it's made things very difficult and, and you know for quite some time I think right now the, the work is for, for everyone in the band the work is about sort of re rebuilding our relationship to music um, because there was just so much toxic toxic stuff thrown in there that just is uh, yeah um, the album the Beirut school sort of was released to commemorate I think the journey the 10 years, starting with your very first album, your self-titled album, which, by the way, you signed for me and still is among my prized possessions. Um, uh, uh, but it also included some, some new tracks. Um, since then, what is happening with Mashrur Leila in turn? Are you guys on a break? Are you guys on hiatus? Are you guys sort of seeing what's going to happen? Because you're not necessarily now in the same space anymore, right, Hamid? Right. Yeah, we're not in the same space. And honestly, you know, with, with COVID, it's not like we're going to be on the road anytime in the foreseeable future. You know, I imagine concert spaces will be the last, um, the last thought. Um, but 
Yeah, we're, I don't, I, I honestly don't really know. Right now we're kind of just doing our own thing and trying to like rebuild, uh, rebuild our lives. Um, things kind of really just became impossible at some point. We, we can't play anywhere in the Middle East. Um, and then it, it just was not um, sustainable in any way. When I was in New York, I basically had to, you know, keep getting all these jobs, trying to stay afloat, trying to pay rent because, you know, I get, making music is not a lucrative career. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, there was a, the economic crisis in Lebanon. So it was really, at some point, it just became a question of time. Like, none of us can actually dedicate time to music anymore because the, the nature of, of the, you know, the, the precarious, the level of precariousness was so that we had to hustle for rent, right? Um, which, yeah, um, was its own thing. And I'm back in school now, um, focusing on that for the next couple of years. I, I don't know when or if the band will sort of resume things. I, I really hope we do at some point. It's just... We really do as well, but that 10-year testament, that Beirut School album sort of bringing the journey together will always stand. It's, it's, it's a journey, it, at least for us as listeners, as I'm going to say it, as fans of yours who watched you grow up and grew up with you, who watched you publicly battle so many demons, and in so doing helped us combat our own. I, I really would be amiss, Hamid, if I didn't tell you that you talk about the pain, the intolerable things you went through, and you've been so courageously public about it. But may I interject and keep reminding you of the amount of love, empowerment, of and, uh, and just pure joy. The support that we got is overwhelming and honestly unimaginable. But, you know, it's, it's sort of like... I hate, this is such a bad metaphor, but I'm thinking on my toes, but it's like if you get a plant, right? And if you put, you know, if you put poison in the soil, the plant dies. And if you put vitamins in the soil, the plant thrives. But if you put poison and vitamins in the soil, the plant still dies, right? Wow. And, and at some point, you know, all the love and all the support that we were getting was just, it was one thing and it was undeniable and i'm so grateful i'm so grateful honestly i woke up with a sense of purpose every day for 12 years right but at the same time it was just i i, I can't you know it, it was it was insane it was it was too much and it wasn't it wasn't just conservative people it was also you know a very particular breed of the left and a very particular breed of queer liberationism and it was always something and it's it's the nature of the job Right? But it's just when it's happening on the scale of like, oh, cool, you're also getting banned from governments and getting fatwa and then getting blah, whatever. It was just, it was too much. Huh? Uh, remember the song in Nimni? Yes. I wanted to change the world, but I don't know somehow the world changed me. Would, how would you apply that to Hamid Sinno today? <laughs> it is a bitter irony that I... <laughs> wrote that song, I'll tell you that much. Um, I think I, I think I think I do still want to change the world. I don't think that that part of me has died. I don't know if that part of me is megalomania or some sort of messiah complex. I, have, I have, honestly have no idea what it is, but um, I do still want to engage with the world. It's just right now, I feel like, you know, like, when you're using when you're using your craft as a vehicle for your politics at some point you start paying more attention to your politics than to that craft right and and i i, I you know music is not an afterthought for me music saved my life when i was you know in high school it saved my life in college it literally pulled me off the ledge on so many occasions that um that i i kind of just want to focus on on reclaiming joy from making, from writing, from making music, from whatever it is that I'm doing. And I, I think joy is its own kind of politics and its own kind of resistance that, that is sort of what I need to focus on right now for a bit. Bibi Hamid, let's hope it won't be another 10 years before we speak. And let's hope that the next time you and I sit together, it, it'll be either by the Mediterranean again, or at least without this Zoom business. Mm -hmm.